Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. More importantly, day two of Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey, our friends that are invested heavily in nonprofit um, accounting and finance. They also do for-profit, but they have a very robust nonprofit division. And so we are so excited to welcome back Jeff Hensel, director of Ide Bailey, talking to us this week about AI and all of those things that that implies. Hey, Jeff, it's a good thing when you come back. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. <laughs> well, we're really excited to be talking about um, this process. Miko and I um, really looking at how we should think about preparing our nonprofit organizations for tech changes. Secret nonprofits aren't so great at just jumping in when it comes to tech changes. And so we're going to really um, welcome your guidance and your help. Another thing that we get here daily is tremendous guidance and help from our nonprofit sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. I'm Julia C. Patrick. I am the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by the mindful techie himself, Miko Marquette Whitlock. He's my guy that I go to for all things when I get stressed out about tech. I just got to say. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to allay any of the stress you might be experiencing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I had a little stress, tech stress in the last 24 hours as I witnessed you gentlemen this morning, but we're all good to go. And uh, deep breaths. I was mindful and I let it flow. And so here we are. Jeff Hensel is a director of Ide Bailey. Tell us where you're coming to us from today. So Julia, thanks for having me again. Uh, Jeff Hensel, I am a director at Ide Bailey uh, out of uh, beautiful Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, my role at Ide Bailey is in technology consulting and helping clients understand how, uh, what that means for their organizations and their businesses. So Miko and I were talking about this before. It's fascinating. Um, this is not just about, even though Ide Bailey is an accounting firm, this is not just about accounting and finance, right? I mean, the work that you do transcends this pretty heady situation. For Absolutely. And I think that's a really important point around Ide Bailey's services in particular, is we know that business advisory and organizational advisory, along with all of the other compliance based things that we do around tax and audit, etc. That holistic approach is really what drives the most value. And so we've seen that, especially on the technology consulting side, uh, over the last many years that we've been doing this. You know, I've got to believe that um, when you all decided to pivot or embrace this consulting aspect, it made for better clients across the board, that you could have clients that were coming to you. If your clients are coming to you, especially in the, from the nonprofit sector, and they're more engaged in understanding of the technology components, they're going to be easier to work with, and they're going to have more successful finance and accounting outcomes. Definitely. And for us, it's a relationship business. And the relationship is about the, again, kind of the whole of the organization. It's not just about sort of the compliance things. It's about thinking, helping them with their vision for the future and what they want to do and how do they build um, a strategy to get there. So there's that advisory piece of it is very important. Yeah, really interesting. Well, before we get going, just a few hours ago, um, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded. And not that, you know, the the nonprofit shows cutting edge but yes we are cutting edge because this year's um nobel prize in physics was awarded to dr jeffrey hinton um, university of toronto known as the godfather of ai and that's what we're talking about this week um he is credited with coming forward with a concept of machine learning he worked with google just retired um, and he's the one that is credited also with crafting artificial neural networks that mimics the human brain in in the machine world right so super cool that we would be engaging in this conversation and um 
I think super important, right? I mean, because this is where we're at and this is where we're going. We're not going back. I, I personally believe that's true. I think it's interesting that um, the the prize was announced today. I think it's also interesting. I suspect there may be in the in the physics world there may be a little debate on whether computer science is actually physics. But we'll <laughs> see how that plays out. Um, but I do think the 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 you know sort of the announcement is timely in the sense that it's top of mind and the things that uh, that they've achieved on the artificial intelligence front particularly over the last 10 years are really remarkable and they're the foundation for where we're going. We're at a bit, I mentioned this uh, yesterday, but we're at a bit of an inflection point uh, yeah. in terms of uh, access and ability for people to, um, to understand what it, AI really can do to su support their organizations and businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would add to that, that I think we are, we're reaching a place where we're seeing the infrastructure of technology expand, right? So before when, you know, the internet was was newer, there was this debate about, well, you know, how essential is, is this gonna be for life and work moving forward? And we and we know that it's essential because when the internet goes down or there, there's no <laughs> Wi-Fi and you look at people's reactions <laughs> and how they respond, <laughs> it's as if life has ended, right? And so that's how you know that you've created new infrastructure, right? And I think we're, we're we're perhaps moving to a place where pretty soon that'll be the place with AI where, where, where folks will, you know, if, if it goes down or, or it malfunctions in the middle of an update or something like that, and folks are like, wait, wait, I, I can't do what I was hoping I could do today because this essential tool that I've been using is no longer available right now in this moment. So I think that's an interesting aspect of this as well. You know, Miko, as the mindful techie, do you feel like that our brains in, the, in terms of the human brain, that we are changing our brains and our brain patterns with this technology? I can witness, you know, as a woman in her early 60s, my brain is functioning different, differently and at a, at a different speed than it did as when I was growing up uh, without any computers. And we didn't have that in school, we didn't have that except at high level government agencies or, or whatever. And now, even my cell phone, if my cell phone's not functioning, I'm a mess. Yeah. Right? Well, so, yeah, I, I think that there may be a few things happening there. So I'm, I'm not an expert on the on the neuroscience. I want to just put that out there. But, you know, we, we do see that there's research that sees what the impact is on our attention spans, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, there are impacts on anxiety and stress levels. We see that particularly with social media, for example, particularly with younger folks, it's been a lot more about that. I think, in fact, the, Sur the U.S. Surgeon General, um, you know, has, has spoken a lot about that particular impact on, on that, on the younger age group. Uh, and so it's it's something that we want to, to, to be mindful of mm -hmm. um, and to understand that the technology is, is a supplement, it's not a replacement. I think this came up in a previous conversation that we had yesterday with Jeff, that this is a supplement that is not a replacement. And I think that's important because it's really about the human connection, right? It's really about the human part of this. And I'll just say one last thing to this. So relationship expert Esther Perel talks about us being in a time where we're experiencing collective social atrophy right, where we have, we're experiencing generational shifts, we're experiencing differences in terms of how we're using technology, how interconnected we are with the technology in our lives, and it's impacting our ability to be able to connect deeply with one another. And so I think that's something that we have to be mindful of. And, you know, more and more of the research is paying attention to this. And I think we still have more to learn about the impact. I don't think we fully understand yet all of it. Some of it is anecdotal for folks that have maybe younger children, nieces or nephews, you know, we all have sort of our theories about connection between technology and screen time and behavior. Um, but I, I think we have a lot more to learn. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. And I think it, it leads Jeff to our first question. And that is, and you touched on this yesterday, that, that really one of the foundational pieces of this is understanding our data and how to use it, um, which I bet for a lot of folks are like, what? We thought AI was just plug it in and go, baby. <laughs> and so talk to us about looking at this with a different framework. 
Yeah, I, and I think that's a really good point. I think that data is the foundation for all of artificial intelligence. If you if you think about the way the human brain works, you can make a decision on something unless you have some sort of a framework or some sort of information in your own head about how to do that. And I do think that uh, that AI is is built on data. The thing that I think a lot of organizations don't think about is the different types of data. Uh, so stru- what we call structured data, data that's in databases and and in you know line of business apps or um, you know specific uh, apps that you might have in a software as a solution versus things you might have from an on-premises perspective relative to your organization. And then there's all the unstructured data. There's Word documents, and PDFs, and you know spreadsheets, and all this other text-based um, data that also for generative AI in particular is really important to understand not only what it is, but where it is. Mm-hmm. And, and I think from a, an organizational perspective, you need a strategy for that, for both structured and unstructured. The, the last thing I'll say is that for nonprofits, at the end of the day, they're really no different than any other you know, for-profit organization. They'll have a lot of systems of record. They'll have lots of tools that they use every day to do the work that they do. And understanding how that data works together and how you think about that from a collective artificial intelligence, what do I want to have exposed to an AI algorithm versus what do I not? Um, there are there are things you can do, but you have to have a plan for that. Wow. Yeah. And I, Jeff, I, I wonder if you could maybe talk a bit more about the culture inside an organization, because it's one thing to have a strategy. It's one thing to have the tools. But I've, I've worked across sectors in pro- for profit and government and nonprofit. And maybe it's just my experience, but in every organization I've worked in, there have been formal data structures and, and systems. But there's also the informal system, right? So you know the informal system. People have their Dropbox, the people have their shared drive, people have their thumb drives. And so, you know, Sharon and HR has this folder on some drive that no one else has access to. Bob and accounting, you know, has a set of data over here. Yeah. Um, and you could put in place the most robust, the fanciest CRM or accounting software. But if you don't have a culture where there's a shared understanding about how you use the data, where the data goes, you know, everyone following the same policies, um, you could spend a lot of time and money on something that takes you nowhere. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, we see that um, somewhat frequently when we work with clients in, in that they don't think about data as really sort of the starting point and the asset and, and, then, and then walk that back to what does that mean for who has access to it? Where, where is sort of the, um, you know, the secret stash of, of information that somebody has? Uh, because those things matter in terms of not only the effectiveness of the organization, but honestly, from a, you know, an AI and security and how do you leverage that really important content in a way that's secure, et cetera. I do think one of the things that can help with that, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, is governance. Sort of getting everybody aligned and on the same page and having that really inclusive uh, cross organizational uh, structure to 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 manage that. And uh, but at the end of the day, our you know, our framework is you always need to start with data. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I love what you said, Nico, about, you know, Bob and accounting and, and Sharon and HR and all these things going on that we do have internal issues, we have external issues. I've got to ask the two of you, how do you even get everybody to understand what their data is and how important it is? Because Miko, you use the the culture world word and this is a heavy lift for a lot of organizations when they're learning at the same time, right? They're they're not only just trying to figure out what's gonna work, but they're having to learn some heavy, heavy things. I mean, I, I, Jeff, I don't know, how, I'm curious what you think about this, but I, I always start when I'm working with teams with any type of, you know, change, organizational change, whether it's tech related or not, you know, what is our shared mission and vision? Where are we mm-hmm. trying to go? And can you paint a picture of the impact that you're trying to have 
And then once you're able to get everyone sort of on board and bought into that vision and the impact that you're trying to achieve, then we can talk to Sharon and say, hey, Sharon, you know, I noticed that you have this set of data about, you know, health insurance utilization. We would love to be able to include this in this new system. As you, as you remember, we talked about the shared vision and having this data would be super helpful. Can we work with you on a different way to collect and hold this data? You can go to Bob and accounting and then begin to have that same conversation. And it's an ongoing process. It's not a one time mm -hmm. thing. It's not like you you bring Jeff in one time, you have a workshop or a nice talk and he gives you a, a nice document with a, a 10 point strategy and you, you check off all the things on that strategy and you sort of go about your day. No, it's an ongoing process and practice, which is why I brought up the word culture, right? Culture is an ongoing mm -hmm. way of how we connect and go about doing the work inside an organization. So um, Jeff, I'm curious, you know, how, how you see it. I, I absolutely agree, Nico. I think you're, you're uh, spot on and, and make a great point in, the ter in terms of when we work with clients on AI in particular, we always have what we call, you know, the change management component. And a big part of that is alignment on the strategy and, and the vision for what they want to do and then making sure that once that's aligned within their organization that there's a, a plan to roll that out uh, across the various uh, teams and, and individuals and, and people that need to hear that message and then reinforce it because i do think that's you know as, as people have these uh, secret stashes of information that are really <laughs> critical to running an organization in many cases they will what even once you go you know if you start using a tool for a certain set of tasks they'll revert back to you know what they've done in the past it's just human nature and um, it's not a, it's not necessarily that they're trying to be um you know detrimental to the effort it's just it's how people are wired <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's change is hard right yeah. so i do agree you have to have that that people component, that that human component of change incorporated with any, well, basically any technology change, but AI in particular is is a is a hill that you need to climb. Yeah, and, and really investing, I think, time and resources in the people aspect of it. I, I think sometimes we get caught up in the technology piece and that's important, but that's not really, from my perspective, um, the most important driver in these kinds of conversations. What we wanna focus on is the, the people, because the people and how they're using the technology is actually what's important. I, I've seen lots of organizations across sectors invest lots of money in, oh, we're going to get this fancy new CRM system. We're going to get this fancy new you know accounting software. And it ends up not being as useful as they thought it was because they haven't addressed the underlying issues around, for example, what we just talked about now about data, for example. Um, or what we're going to talk about in a, in a moment about security, um, for example. And so um, you, it's for that reason that I think you could have a sort of an organization that's probably, you know, lower tech, right? Maybe don't have the fanciest database or the, the, the sort of the latest or slickest technology, but they have those sound policies. They have a culture that abides by those. And so they're going to be perhaps more effective and impactful than an organization that has maybe the latest and greatest thing, um, but they don't have a culture of, being able to use it effectively. And I think to your point, Miko, the word culture that you've used a few times there towards the end, the culture needs to sometimes change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we work with clients and particular, you know, especially on the AI front, again, if their culture is not ready for it, we'll tell them to wait. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of walk that back and say, here's why we're recommending and here are the things you need to do. And so culture and data, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the change management uh, aspect of it, I think tomorrow or the next day. And the, that's a, it's a, it needs to be a robust part of any mm -hmm. get started strategy. Absolutely. And for folks that are listening to this and sort of wondering like a simple way to keep this together, one of the ways that I think about this and Jeff, let me know if you think differently, but people first, then information and then the technology or, or the tools i think that's fair and i and i think you know for example with ai there's there's over two thousand large language models right pick which pick which one that fits your needs the most that's the great news the hard part for organizations to your point is finding 
out what you want to do and how do you get people on board to to accomplish your 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 mission and your goals uh, as best you can. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, let's move on to another issue that that kind of navigates us through. We've talked a little bit about security culture. Let's talk about governance because this is another thing that is coming up more and more. Nonprofits are being um, definitely confronted with some of these things that they haven't thought of before. Um, and sometimes until they have a problem or it's too late and they're penalized, what should we be thinking about when it comes to governance? So, and, and I believe this is true of all technology from an organizational perspective, but it's not just the role of um, a technology manager or the CIO of an organization or uh, the IT leader. Yeah. It, it is a collective opportunity to come together to understand how technology impacts your business. AI will exasperate that in the sense that the data that you need to be most effective with AI comes from lots of different places within an organization. Nonprofits are no different. So you need to know that everybody, number one, understands the scope of how you're going to start and what some of the long-term objectives are, that's an important part of governance. There's also the piece that is shared ownership and decision-making yeah. uh, across lots of different things. It's about what data are we going to, you know, what solutions do we want to put in place with AI? How do we get started? What data do we need? How do we ensure it's correct? How do we sure it's good data? How do we make sure it's not biased or or we have the right data to make the best decisions using artificial intelligence. Because I think that's a very frequently where AI will tip over in terms of machine learning and as well as uh, generative AI is you don't really have all the information for the machine to learn what it really needs to learn. So you get you know the whole bias aspect of it. And in a nonprofit space where you're delivering services, depending on the scenario, you don't want that bias because a, a human will be able to make some decisions based on just what they know versus you know what's in the data. And that's the difference. So those are really important things that the governance group needs to be aware of and help work on together. So Jeff, a follow-up to this that overlaps with sort of the, sec the security discussion, um, how should organizations be thinking about as they're experimenting and learning these tools the type of data that they're using to, to learn on, you know? So if someone is using, for example, um, you know, chat GPT, maybe they're using the free or low cost version, um, feeding it confidential data and not knowing how chat GPT or, or yeah. open AI, which is a company that builds it is using it. Like how should organizations be thinking yeah. about those kinds of questions? Those are really important questions from a security standpoint, both from an external security. So, uh, you know, cybersecurity is one thing, the outside in hacker coming in, but the, the bigger risks that with AI are frankly internal uh, security as much as what you're sharing out to an external model. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we guide clients on is platforms matter. Understand mm -hmm. who your provider is, understand mm -hmm. what they're, how they use the data, where that data goes, et cetera. We also are really clear with a lot of our clients that as amazing as ChatGPT free version is, just allowing all of the, your users to sort of upload documents to that, um, there, there are privacy and security and all sorts of other risks to that in terms of what it is then training the open AI model. So understanding that is a complex landscape, understanding how the data flows, where it goes, how it's secured, mm -hmm. um, you know, in and out of a, a large language model service is one thing. The other thing is really internally within your organization. So if you want to leverage things like unstructured documents, things that are on SharePoint sites or, uh, you know, in, in file folders uh, on OneDrive or things like that, in, in our case, that's how we leverage it within iBailey you need to understand who has access to those and what the data is. So there is a significant sort of privacy, internal security 
bit of work that has to happen as well. Mm -hmm. the, the classic example is the HR data, right? You don't want um, you don't want your HR data out on a, a, a hidden air quotes hidden folder on on a SharePoint site because um, security through obscurity isn't a good option. <laughs> Security through obscurity. I love that. Well, I borrowed that, by the way. That's not my own quote. Uh, I, don't, I can't explain the source, but I love that one. So I'm reading no, it. It paints a picture. Let's yeah. talk about some of those things because you're, you brought up HR, which I think is a natural thing that we're like, oh, yeah, that's like top secret. We've got to be really you know mindful of that and protect everything. But you have some other areas that we need to be thoughtful about when we're um, talking about that. And so those other areas to consider are fascinating. First of all, let's talk about the legal aspect. What do you mean by that, Jeff? Well, I think the legal aspect is you need to understand, uh, depending on how you're using AI, what are the legal ramifications of you leveraging AI in something you either deliver or use internally uh, and it's not necessarily just about copyright infringement or things like that. Okay. There are lots of different considerations relative to uh, AI emerging legislation, not just at the federal level, but you're seeing it at the state level too. And so just understanding what that means, especially in, uh, in a, uh, some of the uh, sectors of nonprofit around healthcare and other regulated, highly regulated, you need to understand what those are before you just jump in and, and get started. I think that's that's absolutely uh, one. And then I think um, you know from a from a donor perspective, d donors the transparency you have to have you must have transparency with both donors as well as everybody. Really, you need to have that's part of governance. You need to have that as a stated. Here's our policy on AI. Uh, as much as you can or want to share on how you use it, uh, I think that's important. And how, and probably most importantly, how their their data, the data that you collect from individuals, is used as well. And I think that ties back into the the legal aspect. So, so Jeff, to this point, are we talking about, for example, when folks opt in to receive text messages, are we talking about that type of disclosure where someone can mm -hmm. opt in to say, hey, like we might use AI to send you a thank you for your donation or something like that. Is that what we're talking about? Or, or, or can you give us an example of what you mean? Yeah, I think um, I think at the end of the day, for example, if you are going to create a, a, a process where you want to uh, take donor data as an example and abstract it so that you get uh, buckets of information and you want to leverage that in, in AI for understanding giving patterns and things like that, even if you abstract the data, you need to disclose to donors that you're going to leverage AI, but here's the steps we've taken to make sure none of your personally identifiable information is shared uh, within the model or externally or anything like that. So I just think that sort of disclosure is really important. Yeah. And do we have time for one more, Julia? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So <clears throat> you, you've mentioned this point about, um, platforms or, or platforms matter, right? Or which, which version of AI, these AI tools organizations are using. Um, and I wonder if you can maybe speak to how organizations should be thinking about this. So for example, should folks be thinking about, oh, well, do I need to go out and like procure my own server and install my own AI software mm -hmm. and sort of have my own internal network? Or are there vetted providers that are cloud-based that have experience with this type of data sure. protection um, and have those those sort of really firm policies in place? Like, how should organizations be thinking about beyond simply like the free chat GPT model? I think that's a great question. There, there are different ways that AI is going to show up. AI will show up in line of business applications that you already have. Most of those are going to be cloud-based, so software as a as a service type solutions. When I talk about platforms, I'm talking about the big the big players. Microsoft is one that we uh, often recommend for clients because of the fact that they have done a lot of work around responsible AI and they've been doing that for a while. I don't know; I'm not as familiar with Google or 
or Amazon or some of the other large cloud platforms. I will say you won't be buying a server um, typically unless you're going to do your own machine learning and custom models for AI. If you want to use generative AI, you're going to be in a cloud-based solution. And, and I think that's where the knowledge around where does the data go, who owns it, uh, how does it work from an infrastructure standpoint, and then can you trust that, and then what data goes in and out. Those are the things that are the most important from a, a SaaS-based AI you know, kind of platform. Wow. You know, this has been amazing. And, and um, again, uh, yesterday, if you were with us and we started, we kicked off Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey. We talked about generative AI and nonprofits and just this like general concept of what it is, what it isn't, and, and where we think it's going and what we need to be thinking about. Then talking about preparing our nonprofits for success, what does that look like and how do we kind of use to use Miko's you know structure here look at the culture and how do we really have a higher level management we're going to be talking about winning with tech and AI what does that look like what does it look like when it's working and maybe like what does it look like when it's not working so that we can kind of be mindful of where we should be going and then if we're good to go and we understand where we want to go how do we actually get started with it and and we've touched on that a little bit even today um friday we're going to wrap up with ask and answered so those those are your questions that come in things that have been uh, percolating throughout the week so if you have any questions reach out to us on social and then we will try and fit them in we're already pretty packed with questions that have come in um, which is understandable but we want to make sure that we get uh, as many questions answered as we can um, Jeff Hensel director over at Ide Bailey and you can learn more about Jeff his team and the work that Ide Bailey does across the United States at idebailey.com um, they have a tremendous um, breadth and width of uh, experience in the financial marketplace with CPAs that deal and specialize with all sorts of aspects of the practice. And so it's really an interesting thing to connect with. We love iBailey because they connect with us um, through tax and audit with the nonprofit sector, again, throughout this country. And so we, we have a tremendous amount of trust uh, with them and, and their, their practitioners. Um, they're just amazing. Um, again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by Miko Marquette Whitlock, the mindful techie himself. And so I'm so excited, uh, Miko, to be on this journey with you as we explore this really important concept um, throughout the week. We have explored many, many, many topics with nearly 1,200 episodes, five years of broadcasting, and that's due to our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and Your Part-Time Controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Okay, gentlemen, I really appreciate the trajectory of this conversation, especially today when the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, was was bestowed to um, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI. Super interesting. We have many more things to talk about. And so we will be back tomorrow with another episode of Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey. Until then, we remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. Thanks.